The Lord be with you. I invite you to turn with me in your copy of Holy Scripture to the first chapter of Luke's Gospel. I'll be reading in Luke there, chapter 1, verses 68 through 79. Luke chapter 1, beginning in verse 68. Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for he has looked favorably on his people and redeemed them. He has raised up a mighty Savior for us in the house of his servant David, as he spoke through the mouth of his holy prophets from of old, that we would be saved from our enemies and from the hand of all who hate us. Thus he has shown the mercy promised to our ancestors and has remembered his holy covenant, the oath that he swore to our ancestor Abraham, to grant us that we, being rescued from the hands of our enemies, might serve Him without fear and holiness and righteousness before Him all our days. And you, child, will be called the prophet of the Most High, for you will go before the Lord to prepare His ways, to give knowledge of salvation to His people by the forgiveness of their sins. By the tender mercy of our God, the dawn from on high will break upon us, to give light to those who sit in darkness and in the shadow of death, to guide our feet into the way of peace. May God bless the reading and hearing of Holy Scripture. Would you pray with me? And now, O God, may you give us ears to hear Ears to hear your words and not mine. Words that transform us. Words that call us. Words that provoke us to the way of peace. The way of your kingdom. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. You ever get a wild hair? Do you know what I mean? When I, that's okay to say, right? I mean, in my family, where I'm from, there's a bit more to that saying, but, but you all know what it means, right? To, to get a random, out-of-nowhere desire to do something, a hankering for something, a desire to do something, a sudden urge, you, you get the idea. Well, about a year ago, I, I got one of those. I got a wild hair. You see, the kitchen in our house is relatively small, especially if you watch HGTV. I mean, we don't have an open concept or anything. There's not a whole lot of counter space, but there's even less storage space, especially for pantry goods. And Sally had hinted at this more than once to me, so on a Monday, on my usual day off, I was caught up on my reading or trying to find a reason not to do it. And the weather was relatively nice, so I got in my truck, and I drove down to Lowe's. I bought some lumber, some hinges, some screws, a couple of cabinet handles, and a a tube or two of painter's caulk. And I set about in our garage to build a pantry. The plan was to surprise Sally when she got home. Ta-da! Here's a pantry. Eventually, we'd choose a paint color. We'd move it into our kitchen in the very near future. Well, when Sally pulled up, she was surprised. And we started to talk about painting it, but then that led to other things. Well, if we paint that, we'll have to paint the kitchen cabinets. Well, if we do that, we'll have to replace the countertops. Well, if we do that, you know, this flooring is so, so, well, I'm just going to say it looks dirty. I don't think it really is dirty. And then we started talking about this and that, and before long, well... I'm happy to tell you I did finish that pantry, and I think it turned out halfway decent for some old grease monkey who's never done that sort of thing before, being the first time I ever did something like that. You can come by and see it, too, if you want sometime. It's still sitting in the garage. (laughs) Unpainted. In fact, for whatever you'd like to offer, I'll paint it whatever color you want, and I'll put it in your car. Our kitchen is still exactly the same as it was a year ago, except now there are a few more stickers on the refrigerator and maybe a few more stains at about the height of a two-year-old now. you have anything like that at your house, at your place? 
something you've received, something you've bought, maybe something you've built. And maybe it was something you really wanted, felt like you needed it. But here it is now, a year or two later, maybe a decade or more, and it's still in the box. It's stuck somewhere in a closet somewhere, forgotten in an attic. I don't know, sitting on a tarp in the garage, maybe. Maybe there's something like that on your Christmas list this year, and you just don't know it yet. I mean, be honest with you. How many times are you going to use an air fryer? I think everybody's got that thing. Something they once longed for, but once they got it, they just sort of let it sit. Didn't put it to the use for which it was intended. I think for a lot of Christians, their faith in Christ can get that way. Gathering dust on a shelf somewhere. Not being put to the use for which it was intended. I mean, sure, there, there are countless folks. All of us in here, I think, would sing right along with the song that Zechariah is singing this morning in Luke's text. He's been struck mute at the time that John was announced that he was going to be born. And the first words out of his mouth are this song. A song praising God, about God raising up a Savior, a Redeemer, a uh, one who will save God's people from their enemies and the ones who hate them. That's a carol you want to sing. A song you'll even hum along to if it's playing in the grocery store music. You'll, you'll, that's one you want to sing. Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for He has looked favorably on His people and redeemed them. Raised up a mighty Savior. He spoke through the mouth of His holy prophets that we would be saved from our enemies from the hand of all who hate us. Thus He shown mercy, promised to our ancestors, remembered His holy covenant that He once swore to our ancestor Abram. You'll sing the first, second, and the last. Was that Him? Redemption? Savior? Deliverance from enemies? I can get behind that. I like that song. But what good is it if it's just for me? What good is that song if it's just for me? Seriously, what good is it if I just receive it, unwrap it, put it on a high shelf so the kids can't knock it over? What good is it? What good is redemption if all I ever do is put it in a nice case, Display it on the mantle every year next to the nativity scene. What good is it? What good is deliverance if I frame it and hang it on the wall next to that picture from that one time we went to that one place? What good is a savior if I cast him in plaster and just set him in the curio next to grandma's knickknacks? I mean, if it's just about getting something for myself, that I'm never going to use, something I'm never going to employ in the use of making the world better, then what's the point, right? What's the point? Zechariah is singing this song about his son John. He's singing it about Jesus, about this coming child who's going to bring all this to God's people. Redemption, salvation, mercy. But he's singing this after being struck mute at the announcement of John's birth the future John the Baptist. This isn't a song Zechariah sings about himself or, or, or just about the people of God, about Israel as he understood it. It's not a song that spikes the spiritual football, bragging about all that is about to break into the earth for him and for his people. Because the song goes on to say, to grant us that we, being rescued from the hands of our enemies, might serve God without fear in holiness and righteousness before God all our days. Now you can miss it. You can miss it if you're just reading this text as a psalm for the second Sunday of Advent, which is what it is. You can focus on Zacharias singing about John's birth, about the coming news of Jesus' birth. You can hear this song as another Christmas carol, heralding the reason for the season. But my ears hear it a bit differently today. Because I can't help but hear it as a call to action. As a reason for being. As a disruption in the midst of my own coming Christmas comfort. God calling me to something besides a passive receiving. 
You see, this second Sunday of Advent is the Sunday we mark with the theme of peace. A rather elusive thing in this world where name-calling is the norm, ignorance, violence, hatred, bigotry are treated as non-issues or, or even held up as exemplary by folks in some circles. And I'm afraid, I'm afraid we may have even misunderstood peace. You see, I think we've gotten this notion that peace is about what's peace for me. That if I'm at peace, that's all that matters. I think about the first few months that Sally and I were married. We were living in an apartment in Waco. An apartment we assumed was a relatively safe space. We were told when we moved in the place was called University Club. That sounds nice. It's right on the river. They told us plenty of Baylor students would live there. I don't think they did. But one night, or rather one early morning... We had kept hearing footsteps running up and down in the apartment above us. And we figured it may have been children, though we had heard some adults talking too. And so we were concerned. These kids were up late, and there was a lot of loud stuff going on. I think it was a school night. At least that's how I remember it. And so when we called the the apartment office, no one was there. The only other thing we knew to do was to call the Waco police just so someone could come and help out with this noise, make sure everything was okay. And I'm not sure what happened next. I don't even know if they went to the right apartment, but I know the police took someone away from one of the apartments who began to shout obscenities at whoever called the police, that they were going to get whoever called the police on them. I remember when I was back at the seminary telling some of my friends about what happened. One of them said, man, if I were you, I'd have just got some earplugs and gone on to sleep. But I think he missed the point. For it wasn't just about us and the noise keeping us up and how it affected our sleep. It was about the kids we thought about in that apartment. It was about the shouting we heard coming from right above us. We were concerned about them. Not just about us. But I'm afraid that's sometimes how we think about peace. As long as I have it, it doesn't matter. The rest of the world can figure their own peace out. But peace isn't just about getting it for us. Redemption isn't just about redemption for us. Salvation isn't just about salvation for us. Mercy isn't just about mercy shown to us. For, as the text says, we are being rescued from the hands of our enemies. Why? So that we might serve God and one another without fear and holiness and righteousness before God all of our days. Peace isn't about just finding some satisfaction for me. It's about seeking peace for everyone, including our enemies. And that's hard work. Work that requires putting some miles on our salvation. Some dents and dings in our redemption. It's work that calls us to stretch out our mercy to show that the the love we have from God isn't just a nice centerpiece on the table at Christmas dinner, but an active, wild, relentless thing that drives us to do fearless things even for total strangers, even for those who Zechariah says may hate us. And so maybe, maybe in our Advent waiting, this waiting for the arrival of the Christ child, we are delivered from our enemies. We are shown mercy. We are redeemed by what Christ has done. The Christ who has arrived is arriving and will always arrive. And perhaps we are so delivered, so redeemed, shown such mercy, so that we may recklessly pursue it for others. For all others, even our enemies, even those who hate us, those who don't understand us, and even those whom we ourselves don't understand. Because when we do that, when we put to use these miraculous, undeserved gifts from God, then Christ is born once again within us. 
The advent of God becomes real for us and those with whom we share this life. A guy I've been reading a lot lately named Pete Rollins. He's an Irish uh, sort of radical theologian is what he calls himself. Pete was accused one time of denying the resurrection. And so he said in front of folks, I may have shared this with you before. He said, of course I deny the resurrection. Every time there's someone who's hungry and I ignore them, I deny the resurrection. Every time there's someone hurting and I don't help them, I deny the resurrection. I want to borrow that and turn, it, turn the clock on it back a little bit. Uh, do I deny the birth of Christ? Do you deny the arrival of the Christ child? Perhaps every time we selfishly seek what's best for us and not others. Every time we think this mercy, this salvation, this redemption is just for me and not others. Maybe the Christ in the cradle fades just a little bit for us. The advent of God becomes real for us and those with whom we share this life. When we take down our faith, our salvation, our redemption, our mercy, when we take it down all from the shelf and start using it. Then, as Zechariah sings, by the tender mercy of God, the dawn from on high will break upon us to give light to those who sit in darkness and in the shadow of death, to guide our feet into the pathway of peace. Into the way of peace. Isn't that an odd way to say it? Peace is a way. Isn't that something? You know, I guess I've never thought about it that way. I thought it was something you achieve, something to grasp, something you'll cross the line and say, here it is, we've got peace. But the dawn from on high will break upon us to guide our feet in the way of peace. Peace is a way. How about that? Let's pray together. Lord Jesus Christ, Prince of Peace, Son of God, and Giver of the Holy Spirit. Lord Jesus, help us to hear in this Advent waiting your voice calling us ever on. Lord, Help us to take these gifts that you give us, gifts we do not deserve, gifts for which we cannot work to achieve. And help us, Lord, to take them and use them for your kingdom. To not hoard them for ourselves, believing they are ours because we are special. But, Lord, because you, you recklessly share it with all and call us to do the same. So, Lord Jesus, speak to us. Holy Spirit, call us now into an active waiting for this advent, this inbreaking of God's kingdom. And help us to see that we are a part of it. Actively called, actively gifted, actively equipped for your work in this world in creating a way of peace. Be with us now, Holy Spirit, we pray in Christ's name. Amen.